This session, ladies and gentlemen, will focus on the specific types of enablers that are required to achieve sustainable development goals. The objective of this panel discussion is to share general and specific enablers that play a key role in supporting the achievement of the global agenda. So uh, I would like to start this session with Your Excellency, Mr. Rashi. We want to know more uh, from you on the experience of, uh, uh, of your country in, on its road to implementing the SDGs now. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Or before afternoon. It's, good. it's morning now. We still have five minutes. <laughs> good morning. In our country, especially, it's morning, really. So thank you very much. And I am very honored to have this opportunity to share our country's perspective uh, on implementation of the SDGs agenda. And I think that really this agenda is most ambitious and most complex global agenda uh, of international community has uh, ever agreed upon. So what, what we think is important and what are the key enablers uh, or principles for this agenda from our country's perspective is, uh, I would say the first one is uh, the policy integration. So from our perspective, we think, and especially in our country, it's uh, very important that the sustainable development must lie in the heart of all policies, national, regional, and local one. And uh, also, it's uh, very important to, and also in the foreign, foreign policies. So uh, to achieve uh, these goals, we have to take an all steps to be this uh, agenda as a core of a strate strategic political framework. The second principle on the second enablers, so very important for this agenda from uh, my point of view is uh, participation. So we think that it's not possible to achieve our goals without participation of all groups of people, uh, women and men, um, groups and um, individuals, um, young or elderly people. So we think that it's a second enabler which is very important for us. And uh, the third one and the fourth speaker of us. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> welcome is a partnership. We think that we have to build partnership uh, among uh, various stakeholders in, uh, in every country. It means uh, the state, the academia, the private sector, the NGOs, uh, regional and municipal administrations. So we think that all these stakeholders, stakeholders have to play a role in this uh, SDGs and the fulfill of SDGs. Um, of course, very important is fin financing and budgeting. And uh, in our country, we had the problem to, to persuade that uh, agenda SDG, because it's beyond polit political cycle in our country, it's political cycle for four years, and usually mm -hmm. you have a problem to persuade um, the Minister of Finance or government as a whole that you have to plan and invest for something which is beyond the political cycle. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, uh, we are just in process of drafting a long-term uh, strategy development of Slovak Republic uh, up to 2030. Uh, we prepare uh, and we piloted a national investment plan. And what is uh, very important that uh, this uh, development strategy until uh, 2030 is the and will be the main tool for us uh, to implement the SDGs. And what we think that we uh, we have uh, linkages between a national investment plan and uh, priority investment project uh, and particular SDGs. So. All these three principles, plus financing and budgeting, it's uh, something which you, which, which you must to have. And uh, of course, the, to have some linkages between your national strategy, national investment plan, and SDG. So, so I think these are the main principles which we have to use, especially in our country, if we want to fulfill all, all our um, SDGs, so sustainable development goals. Nice. Your Excellency, Ms. Maria, if we achieve all the 17 goal, uh, goals, then we will reach the well-being, if I may say. 
Um, are we progressing to reach this goal? Can you tell us more about the experience of your country? Yes, first uh, allow me to say that we are very honored to be here today with you. And uh, in Costa Rica's case, I think it's a combination of things that has enabled uh, the way we have advanced with Agenda 2030. Um, it's starting from our constitution, from our second republic. It says, uh, Article 50, uh, that we believe in growth, but with distribution of wealth and, and also including other people and doing it all with pres while preserving the environment. So this is at the heart of the foundation of our, of our country, of our democratic tradition, uh, sustainable development. So it is part of our, of our DNA as a, as a republic. Um, being said that we, have, we believe that one of the key enablers for Agenda 2030 has to do with strong institutions. It has to do with sound governance. It has to do with a policy that is tailor-made and at the same time that is evidence-based. So our strategy for, for dealing with poverty, for dealing with inequality, is uh, it's called Bridge for Human Development, which is at the key of our strategy for well-being. And in doing so, what we have is a, is a folk, if we focus on going for the people. So our administration goes and visits uh, based on maps and, and geolocalized information. They goes looking for people at their house and starts giving them the complete offer of social aid. At the same time, we also have this uh, strategy that is the second phase, the best social policy, it's actually a good job. Uh, so incorporating people to formal economic markets and labor markets or have, giving them tools so they can actually start their own business and be making their business uh, sustainable in the long run. Another thing that we also believe in is uh, mobilizing resources. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, this lately, uh, lately last year in December, we engaged in uh, fiscal reform, which is a progressive fiscal reform, so we can actually give more money to those who are in the, in the more need. Because uh, we think about financing for development, but it starts with us. It starts with the countries and, and now developing countries can also give to it. And well-being is also about having the resources in order to uh, orient them and direct them towards well-being for people and towards the most in need in our country. And along that will also a strategy where um, the category for sending and deciding where, where the flows of cooperation and investment goes hasn't, doesn't have to be only by GDP, but actually thinking about a more multi-dimensional measurement so that we can actually recognize those countries that are more in need, but at the same time those uh, that are middle-income countries such as ours, which do not uh, also have, we also have certain gaps that we need to cover and we have been working towards it. So thinking about global enablers and the responsibility we'll have to well be been in the globe at a, as, a, as a whole community of, of citizens in the world. Uh, and the other thing about sound governance and financing for development, the third one I would like to mention has to do with, um, with the state of respecting uh, human rights and it has to do also with incorporating women uh, to, to labor markets and to have an active participation in politics. We have seen that uh, the Gini coefficient in our country actually varies a lot and inequality goes down a lot the more women we incorporate in our economy. I know you've done a lot on women and yes. youth empowerment in Costa Rica and I will get back to this point in my, in Thank my you. next question. Mr. Dangermund, um, how can cross-cutting issues be beneficial instead of being a hindrance in achieving SDGs? I'm speaking specifically here about data sharing, and I know this can be a kind of obstacle. It is, actually. My background is in geography and computers or geographic information systems. So I've been working closely with the UN to build what several of the previous speakers talked about, an information system or a federated information system for the SDGs. And essential to that is the question that you asked, which is about data sharing. So this system, which has been architected, is about national systems or national portals collaborating and sharing data into a global system. This is an interesting notion. Um, and we've tried it now on initially six countries, and then now up to 19 countries who are locally focused. They build their national statistics and geographic information 
portal and they produce maps on the SDGs. And then that portal shares content up to the UN's portal, a kind of system of systems. You follow what I'm talking about? This uh, notion of, of sharing indicator based on standards that the UN has been putting forth, indicator data as maps and geographic data openly. And then that goes into this master system that covers the whole globe. So as a geographer, geography is a kind of science of our world. Mm -hmm. And I see it as the way that SDGs have to be organized because people don't want to just have one statistic for a country. They want to have statistics for the subnational area. How are we doing with poverty over here versus there? How are we doing with forestry here versus there? And taking all those pieces of a mosaic or puzzle and putting them together into a a global system is the big is the big vision, and your question is how is it doing? Uh, and it's doing pretty well so far. Great. <laughs> we have six, with now 19 going to between 50 and 60 this year, but there's lots of local politics, and part of the reason why we've been able to be successful is we've said each of the hubs in each country, each of your countries, for example, is owned by the country. And they can openly share, based on standards, the SDG standards or indicators, their content on a volunteer basis. Eventually, 2030, this has got to be increasingly open. But so far, what's occurring is capacity is being built, and gradually, people are opening up their data in other words, open data isn't an event, it's a process. And gradually people are becoming more used to this idea of sharing and seeing each other's progress and developing benchmarks about each of the SDGs. Now it's in early years, I mean it's really early years, but as we grow as a global society, sharing and seeing spatially through maps and statistics, the, the report that Dr. Muhammad talked about earlier this morning having a standard one world view that's uh, based on authoritative sources, this, this will get better. So I, I, okay, I'm talking too long, but did I answer your question? Um, thank you. Professor Giovannini, Mr. Dengerman tackled a very important issue which is local politics that sometimes can be a very big obstacle in implementing any of the SCGs um, anywhere in the world. So I want to know from you and from your experience, how can we mobilize the civil society to implement the SDGs, for example, through education maybe? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me say that I'm very pleased to see that at the center of this uh, World Government Summit, the well-being SDGs are really very, very important. And uh, uh, I would like to congratulate the government uh, of uh, UAE for doing that. Uh, I was, I fall in love with SDGs even before SDGs were adopted because Amina Mohammed, who spoke this morning, asked me to chair the International Panel on Data for Sustainable Development even before the agenda was agreed. And so um, after stepping down as Minister of Labor, I said to myself, uh, what can I do for this? So I decided to try to establish this Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development, which is a quite uh, interesting uh, experience worldwide. Uh, we have now 220 organizations. Uh, individual companies cannot be part of our alliance, so we are talking about all the trade unions, the business associations, but not individual companies, and also environmental associations, municipalities, regions, and universities. Um, we have an office in Rome and another in Milan, and uh, we are really becoming uh, a driving force for sustainable development in Italy. We are doing work in education. Our e-learning um, e course on SDGs has been taken by 33,000 teachers last year and 28,000 will take it this year. 
we have established the Italian Alliance uh, the, the network sorry, of uh, universities for sustainable development. 61 universities joined the network and uh, we are rethinking not only how we manage universities but how we teach sustainable development across different courses. We are doing summer uh, courses for journalists, policy makers, and so on. So the education pillar is quite strong. But also we do a lot of research, especially as a statistician, I was a chief statistician at the OECD for nine years. We developed uh, composite indicators for European countries, Italy, the regions, and now we're working on the cities. Because as everybody who works on data knows very well, Dealing with 200 indicators is very complicated. Therefore, we built a composite indicator for each goal, and we can monitor the evolution, including Slovakia, uh, over time uh, in order to compare in a way through dashboards that can be understood. We have developed a model, a general equilibrium model for the entire world where we can simulate alternative policies for sustainable development. And then we do a lot of work on advocacy and policy advice. Let me mention here only three things. In a few days, the, a general call for having a, a change in the Constitution will be launched in order to include the concept of sustainable development in our Constitution. Sustainable development is about intergenerational equity. And most of the constitutions written after the Second World War don't have this concept. They have uh, intragenerational equity, but not intergenerational equity. France, Norway, uh, Switzerland, uh, Belgium have changed their constitutions. We have already a low uh, proposal in the parliament, but we will call citizens to sign up for a petition to have this change. And last remark I would like to make, is the Italian Festival of Sustainable Development. We organized uh, this since 2017, 17 days, you know why, of course, like the goals, and my colleagues say, thanks God uh, you have not chosen the 169 targets. Um, so 17 days across Italy. Last year we had 700 events in 17 days, 300 of them were organized by universities, by students, for young people. We must go and check that. Uh, it's uh, it's a quite amazing effort. Our spot is on uh, soccer, um, football uh, games, the, la the last uh, day of our national championship mm -hmm. in uh, airports and so on and so forth. So it's really a mobilization. Yeah. The only weakness we are seeing is our government unfortunately, <laughs> because uh, after well, we managed to have them uh, taken this seriously, the previous government, for example, taking the responsibility, as you said, close to the prime minister, because SDGs are so wide that only the prime minister can do that, they um, have put this, the new government has put this on hold, and in two weeks at the parliament we will call all the political leaders to ask, uh, well, most of you sign our 10 points before the last elections. I would, I Where would get are we now? To, I will get back to this point, but I want to um, tackle an issue with Mr. Rashi. Who monitors the government's jobs in implementing SDGs? I mean, the 17 goals are great. I don't know if we have the time to be done by 2030, but who monitors the government's role worldwide in implementing the SDGs? So, uh, Madam Amida Mohamed said in the morning that um, this year is year of uh, leadership, mm -hmm. and I think that it's something which is very important for 2030 agenda. And uh, as was said, that uh, it has to be in the heart of uh, also of Prime Minister office, because otherwise you are not able to implement any of goals because uh, goals are about politi uh, about political decision, but they are they are also about investment and money. Uh, in our country, we, this agenda is in my office, it's Office of Deputy Prime Minister of Investment and Informatization. But uh, what is, uh, from my point of view, uh, very important that uh, 
we try to create a linkage between, as I said, national development strategy until 2030 and national investment plan and SDGs. And because, uh, especially in Europe, we have very uh, strange political cycle sometimes, uh, coalition and opposition, they change up to down, and, and what is true in the morning uh, after, after election can be completely opposite. Mm. So that's why we try to, uh, and we did it, it was a broad stakeholder process across whole countries, all parties, uh, NGOs, academia, governments, municipalities. So we prepare our own six Slovak priorities from uh, agenda 2030 because uh, 17 uh, SDGs, uh, I mean, it's for everybody, but in our country we try to select uh, what is uh, the most important for us from, um, from 17 goals. What is the most important for you from the 17 goals? You know, we don't have a problem in our country like uh, poverty or problem with education. So uh, we, we think about um, climate changes, about um, green economy, about um, education and the digital skills. So we try in this, in, uh, and of course environment, it's very important for us. So we try to focus SDGs to our local and territorial mm -hmm. approach. On one hand, and in our foreign policy, we create special funds for supporting countries from uh, Africa mm -hmm. and other countries, and we are uh, because we, have, we are only five million citizens, but we are one of the most um, donor for these countries, for special project, mm -hmm. for education, for water, water supply, and so on and so on. Thank you. Your Excellency, Ms. Maria, I, you, you're the Minister of Planning, yeah. and uh, I know you worked a lot on gender equality. So I want to know from your experience, what, how did you work on it in planning? How, how is it now? What, can you, if you can share with us some numbers about um, uh, decreasing the gender gap. Yes, uh, the, my office is the it's the Minister of Planning and Economic Policy, and we're working in the in terms of of gender in different ways. The first one is that we recently have run a model in order to analyze what uh, was the impact in reducing inequality because mm -hmm. we have done a really good job reducing poverty somehow, but uh, inequality is much more difficult because it's the way that uh, wealth is distributed in all, all the different percentiles and, and decils of income. And, and we have found out with that econometric modeling that uh, one of the key aspects is incorporating more women into formal labor markets or having them be part of uh, entrepreneurship or but being directed by them, but in sustainable areas where they have, there is a global demand for the uh, goods and services they're producing. So in that term, we're trying to, to build up a uh, policy that is uh, tailor-made in order to grant their participation. Mm -hmm. And we're, it's not a homogeneous strategy because it would fail. So it depends on, for example, our decarbonization plan. So we have all these uh, new areas of, of work linked to the more in innovative side of our economic and dealing with the fourth industrial revolution, more in the side of um, digitalization and decarbonization mm -hmm. as strategies. And then we're thinking that women could actually lead those and giving them skills so they can actually be part of it. Also, trying for women to be less afraid and becoming and actually giving them an mm -hmm. enabling their participation in terms of we, policy. We like to see women empowered. Yes. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> and, and more in politics and more in charge of, of directing economic strategies. And also been uh, thinking about how uh, the care system mm. is more inclusive so they can actually participate actively. My country is going to be in 2050 an elderly society, so we have to prepare in advance for it. And just like many other European or, or Asian societies. But uh, that means that we have another challenge in terms of, of women and we have to be even more productive. Now, mm -hmm. my country doesn't have issues with compet competitivity, but I also we have challenges with productivity, so we have to close that gap as well. So it has to be um, develop, develop those jobs and, and, and the economic matrix in terms of this whole new strategy, but being very intensive and having the, the skills and the education needed in order to overcome uh, the challenges that we have ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dangerman, there are many successful examples on how satellite technology helps in de-escalation of any humanitarian crisis um, in many hostile zones. 
So how can, from your experience, how can geographic information systems eradicate poverty? Well, these systems create maps, and maps help us understand things. And fundamental, fundamental to action is understanding. I like to say the words understanding precedes action. Would you agree? Yeah. Or at least it should. <laughs> and fundamental to understanding is science-based analytics, data collection, observation, um, like that. So in my mind, I say we observe things, we analyze things, we make pictures of things, and mm -hmm. then we act on them. And this process, sometimes called the science of geography, is a kind of foundation for how we think about our world and how we act in our world. So with respect to creating the understanding that will be necessary to address the large challenges in the world, I'm simply saying we need to measure, we need to aggregate data spatially, it's, it's very and we impressive. need to be able to act on it. And Earth observation from satellites is one of those sets of measures. That's synoptic measures from picture taking. The other one is bottom up, where we record statistics, mm -hmm. census statistics, uh, or observational statistics in the field. So the combination of this Earth observation and, and, and organizations in every country that collect statistical data brought together in a GIS help us see and understand things and therefore act. That's the whole cycle of a GIS. Doing, very, that, at, doing yeah. that at a global scale. It is very impressive is, to see how technology helped in uh, eradicating poverty, whether it was uh, with drones or satellite. Um, Professor Giovannini, my last question goes for you before I open the ground for a few minutes for questions. Um, what are the challenges that governments face in implementing the essential enablers that are required uh, to achieve SDGs? The complexity. The agenda is very complex. And some governments and are even changing the names and the organizations of their ministries. In yes. uh, France, in uh, Spain, they have merged the Minister of Environment together with the Minister, uh, Ministry in charge of Energy, Innovation, Transportation, and they call it uh, the Ministry of Ecological Transition. This is a, a great way of thinking because uh, either we develop uh, a new wave of investments to make our economy really circular, really carbon free and so on, or we, especially in developed countries, we will never develop uh, growth that will be also able to create jobs and so on. But this is a complex agenda. And it's difficult to explain also because, if I may say, media have a lot of difficulties, again, in uh, joining uh, or putting the different domains together. They talk about uh, climate change, and then they talk about uh, agriculture, and then emergency in jobs and so on. But they don't see very often that all these pieces are linked We to usually each other. see what you give us, so... No, no, but it's just one of the reasons is because uh, newspapers are organized in silos like the governments. Yeah. So SDGs from this point of view is an incredible challenge from a conceptual point of view. Thinking that the economy doesn't come before the other domains, social, environmental, and institutional domains, is a big shift. Uh, and I'm an economist. I teach economics. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to teach this kind of change in paradigm. So I think this is the most important difficulty that governments and are facing. Since you teach economics, I remember my professor taught me a lesson that everything has a root of economy, any political problem. And he, he just uh, planted this thing in my brain. So I agree with you. Now I want to open the ground for questions. If anybody has a question. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is uh, Irina Bokova. I'm the former director general of UNESCO. And um, I'm just talking to a former colleague from the World Health Organization. And uh, listening to the 
current debate and the previous one. And um, I think one of the challenges uh, is that um, still the Sustainable Development Agenda uh, 2030 uh, in many places uh, is looked differently or at least is not very much uh, um, integrated with the Paris Climate Agreement and all mm -hmm. the commitments mm -hmm. taken there. And um, I think uh, we have to look at that as one agenda. Of course, it's uh, a different setting of adoption uh, and elaboration, but uh, still they look separately. And we see what happens uh, when they look separately. I'm not just mentioning uh, uh, some of the problems uh, in Europe, which are very conspicuous in my view, uh, in France, in Germany, even in some other countries, let alone in developing countries which are still struggling with uh, many of these issues. So from that perspective, I think the uh, example with Spain is very interesting, how they integrate uh, domestically. But uh, how do you see this from that perspective of having one agenda, yeah. Paris Agreement and Agenda 2030? Thank you, Ms. Bokova. Yes. So, OK, Ms. Maria. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to. Uh, in our case, we have we have been working for with, with SDGs, and we have we have this um, decarbonisation of, of the economy plan, which is an attempt to build up on, on, on the agreement of Paris that it to have a long-term decarbonisation strategy for uh, 2050. So we have this 2050 development strategy, and then we have a very important uh, point, which is um, uh, the 2030 agenda. So we have how those are decarbonisation strategy and the sustainable development goals, and then we have build, building linkages between both. So we have this set of goals uh, for our decarbonisation plan, which actually be, uh, contribute to the to getting uh, implementation of, of the Agenda 2030. And for instance, this. The problem is, I believe, that uh, climate change is often seen as only one part of the economy. We have um, an, an energy matrix that is 100% renewable energy in our country, but we have to change patterns of, of production and consumption, and that's where, in the economic matrix, where we have the highest uh, challenge. And um, in our case, we, what we're building on is that this is not about energy, this is not about economic matters, this is about the whole agenda, the whole 2030 agenda and how to build linkages between SDG 13 and the rest of the agenda in terms of uh, building up on resilience and decarbonization, digitalization, eradicating poverty. So in the end, all of the, all of the SDGs will come down to building a different and have incidents in building a different story for our economic matrix and being enabling mm -hmm. then uh, the, the capacity of compliance within both instruments. So we have been yeah. doing that homework. Professor Giovannini, you wanted to add something? Yes. Uh, first of all, one recommendation. Instead of scanning uh, the, the badges uh, to allow people entering into these meetings, uh, put a question, what is goal 13? If you don't answer by art or 17 or whatever, you cannot uh, get into the meeting room. That, this is a joke, but not really. Uh, let me uh, answer your point. Europe is facing exactly this kind of problem. Last week, the European Commission has put on the table a reflection paper. Now it's up to the Council to decide how to answer with three different scenarios. First to make the SDGs the framework for all policies of European level and also at national level. Second, mainstreaming sustainable development. What does it mean? Everything and nothing, we know already. Third, use it only for relationships with developing countries, which is a nonsense, of course. So each and every country has to decide which kind of line especially developed countries, wants to take. And the only way to go, in my view, is really making the SDGs, including climate change, but also fight to poverty, education, mm -hmm. and so on, as the framework. No other frameworks should be used. But as I said, it's a challenge. Mr. Rashi wants to add something just, just, as well, but briefly, just please. One, one yeah. more sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, the important principle for SDG is uh, policy integration. So I said it's in national, regional, and local level, but also at the global level. So I think that also this summit and this meeting, it's about our global view on SDGs, and it's important to connect everybody and to see the view and problems 
and all all problems of SDG and maybe to change our achievement of sustainable development goals. So global approach and global level from, from national view is also very important. Thank you, Mr. Rashi. Ms. Bokova, I hope we answered your question. Um, I'm afraid that would be the last question. Thank you. Actually, my question is for uh, Mr. Dangermont. As we know, the data is very important to make the maps. And uh, from my experience, because I, am, I live in the United States, but I work also, also in the Middle East, I found that collecting data is a real problem. And I mm -hmm. assume that if we look at the maps of the uh, third world countries or developing countries, we found that either they have a lack of data or the data is taken inaccurately. Is there any way we can improve that status? And what, on the global level, what can be done about that? Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, my first thought is that we talked about this panel being exploring ways to integrate the SDGs. And the professor talked about this from an economic perspective. We heard different policy integration perspectives. From my perspective, geography and time, of course, are the two fundamental human ways to do integration, putting all the pieces of the world back together again from all the different sectors, economics, biology, and so on, have been sectorized in science. How do we bring them together? One way to bring them together is using location or geography to do the integration. I wanted to get that in because it's one of the most powerful concepts in the UN's approach to be able to measure and aggregate information for one report for the entire planet. Two sources of information have been explored. One of them is this synoptic view using satellites. And certainly we can't measure everything from satellite, but we're getting better with higher resolution and also with machine learning that allows us to take measurements on the field and relate it to observational data. But the large dimension of human measurement is bottom up. And this requires traditional census taking or statistical capture. The UN has decided to ask and organize the statistical organizations in each country. Some are very good, some are not so good. But using that institution as the sort of bottom-up spatial aggregating organization. And over time, those institutions will get better. So I have no simple answer. There's no magic here. There are some of my colleagues that are experimenting with using social media as a way to indicate different kinds of human trends. Uh, you, you know, doing spatial aggregation of, of social media observations. Some of that is kind of edgy on reliability, particularly if we're saying we want to rely on transparency, bottom up, and authoritative source grounded information reporting for the whole planet. So. Yes, that's, that's just the reality of it, but we must do better. And we can, we can get a long ways there. That's, that's my only offering. Thank you, Mr. Dengman. I hope we answered your question. And uh, I'm afraid we have to uh, finish our discussion for today. I know it's a long discussion that could last for hours. And I still have a lot of questions, but we're running out of time. I want to thank you all for participating in this interesting discussion. And I want to thank all our audience today. I hope it was an interesting session for you and we'll see you in the next session. Thank you.